Welcome to the Plant-Based Podcast. Did you know that plants are truly amazing? Not only can you grow them and eat them, you can also wear them, drink them, nourish your skin with them, and so much more. Let Ellen and Michael inspire you to love plants as much as they do, as they chat with the movers and shakers in this wonderful plant-based world. So, let's dig in. Series 9 is brought to you with Lava Light. Whether you're a novice gardener, specialist grower, or houseplant enthusiast, Lava Light can help you to nourish and protect your plants all year round. The collection comprises eight different horticultural growing media and pest control products, each continually offering the same natural benefits from thermal protection and moisture retention to soil conditioning and continued nutrient boosts. Derived from volcanic deposits, Lava Light is completely natural and sustainable. Look out for it online or in your local gardening stores. So we are here today with Helena Dove in the Edible Science Kitchen Garden. Well, we're actually inside, but we'll pretend that we're because in the Because Kira is garden. under a flight. <laughs> exactly. Very inconvenient, if you ask me. Who put that here? But there are incredible plans to grow and research crops from all around the world. There's even a fungi garden ready to push through the soil. So we came here to get the lowdown. Thank you so much for coming on oh, to the Oh, you're super welcome. I'm really excited. So just first. Well, tell us about yourself. How long have you worked at Q and how did you come to working in the environment that you are? So I've been here for five years now. In fact, five years and a month, which is so we're all at an, at an anniversary. Um, Happy I'm, anniversary. Thank today? you. No, <laughs> oh. no, very soon, a few weeks. Oh. Um, it feels like... If I'd known, I brought biscuits. Oh, yes, I know. There's not, not enough biscuits around here, if you ask me. Um, yeah, so I've been here five years. Before then, I managed a heritage garden up in North London in the Middleton House Gardens. Uh, it's really cool. It's an Edwardian garden, so lots of really long straight lines of vegetables and lots of running lines and making bird scares out of potatoes and trying to do things in a really traditional way and um, before that I was basically a teacher um, so I career changed like a lot of people in the industry so many people so cool. say it and we always say it on the podcast <laughs> so many people say yeah. it but so many people who we interview have career changed in all yeah. cultures I wonder what percentage many. of people staff at Q are career changed it's high yeah. it's really really That's high and we all bring something else different you know? yeah. we get a load of people that are 18 and that's great they do all the hard work we, <laughs> you know that's what we have the 18 year olds for they can lift things still they're not creaking they don't make that noise when they get off the floor I like totally I do I feel that 100% <laughs> with you on that yeah but there is a lot and we bring kind of loads of different experiences and it's really kind of it's really interesting and you never know who you're going to meet mm. you know so yeah it's a, it's a nice career change um, maybe I wouldn't appreciate it so much if I hadn't been a teacher before yeah. Right. Maybe there's that. Um, but yeah, so it's uh, been fun and it's been a great five years. We've done a lot. So <laughs> how did you kind of like, you know, when you first decided you wanted to get into horticulture, where did that come from? Yeah. Like, yeah. Where did that start? So I just remember sort of, I've always grown. I've always grown, you know, my parents edibles. grew food. Oh, yeah, yeah, always yeah. edibles. Yeah. I think we grew up in a mining village in the middle of, uh, of England and <laughs> everyone kind of grew vegetables. Because although it wasn't we weren't, we weren't poor or anything necessarily, but it was just traditional. It was Everyone the culture had to do yeah. that. Oh, same when I was young. Yeah, same, same yeah. Thing yeah. yeah. like yeah. people had allotments. It's a bit of a hangover from yeah. the war, but yeah. like that's what everyone did. So my, my parents always grew and you know, we always had some vegetables from the garden. Mm. Went off to uni and you know, forgot about normal life for a little while. And then started renting and realised I wanted to grow my own. And so I've always had that. And then I was sort of teaching and stuck inside and realised that I just needed to be outside. Like I needed to be outside. It wasn't becoming a, oh, it'd be nice to be outside. It was becoming a, I really have to be outside, even though it's raining. I mm. have to be. I got an allotment, realised I really enjoyed it. Like super, super enjoyed it. So started to change career, did the RHS Level 2 at Rittal, um, got a bit of work experience at a garden nursery, actually, I was really lucky, um, and then did the heebie-jeebie course. But it was just kind of this feeling of, I really need to be outside. And, you, I and you, can't, you can't quash the feeling. Yeah. You have to do it, like, no. and it builds and builds until I think if you don't make the change, you would be unwell 
Yeah. You know, you yeah. have to make the change. And you talk to people that work in this industry and like, you know when you have a relaxing Sunday and, and you think, oh, I'm going to sit down and be inside. After about four hours, most of us are like, oh, really? no, I'm just going to pop outside for right, a second. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, you just for get a week. To- <laughs> <laughs> I know. Don't pop me back inside. Um, yeah, yeah, it becomes like, like being in a room for too long becomes weirdly claustrophobic and suffocating. And so it's a bit addictive, I think. But yeah, I think gardeners have to be outside. Yeah, I agree. That's so cool. And what, what's your role here now with you? So I'm the kitchen Do you have a cool garden. title? I, well, yes, my official title yeah. is Botanical Horticulturist of the Kitchen Garden. But very long. I that just, doesn't fit on a business card. It cover. doth not. So <laughs> I just go with kitchen gardener because it makes more sense. Uh-huh. Um, everyone here is a botanical horticulturalist, which then we get different remits mm-hmm. under that. Um, and, you know, we do look at the botany and we do look at the horticulture. Mm-hmm. But um, it's a lot okay. of words. <laughs> okay. Kitchen gardener, I like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's easier. <laughs> but you've had, um, I was here, I first met you a few weeks ago when you had this grand opening of the yeah. edible science garden. Yeah. Is that the right phrase for edible it science? It is, yeah. yeah, yeah. Because this is a kind of new developed area of Kew where you're kind of showcasing yeah. a lot of the future crops, a lot of different ways we can grow of existing. Yeah. And all being done in a sustainable way as well. So yeah. tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so we've had this idea I've been trialing working with the science department so one of the great things about working here is the science department is right next to the kitchen garden which Mm -hmm. is very convenient and uh, I think I told you the story before about finding a scientist digging around in my beds one day and in my usual manner I yelled at him to get out don't stand in the beds (laughs) and after a conversation he was digging around for a yakon root because he wanted to see if it had so it has a lot of sugar in it that you can't yeah. digest. So it's really good for diabetes and diabetic um, diets. So he was researching that and was trying to find a route at the wrong time of year. So after a few conversations, we just I was like, I can grow them for you. I can harvest them for you. And yeah. from that, I've worked more and more with scientists who are like, That's very cool. That's cool. we can yeah. show our work, we can do this. So we sort of developed it. We knew the kitchen garden needed redeveloping. It was getting it basically so popular that it couldn't sustain. It had like these grass paths that were just compact and weren't growing. Mm. And I'm really bad with an edging machine, so I'd edge around the crops, which meant the paths were getting smaller and smaller and smaller. <laughs> so I was part of the problem. That's the right priority. I think. Yeah, that's right. Okay. I told everyone yeah. I was doing a wiggly edge, but uh, yeah, I was not very. Really However, lines. you want to package that. Up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> basically not very good with one. So it was all just not fit for purpose. So we thought, whilst we're redoing it, let's bring the science in more formally. Um, you know, because the scientists have got so much information to give, mm-hmm. and they don't really have a platform. They don't have an engagement zone. So it's been a bit of a trial but it's worked really well and the public really like it Uh, and the scientists are finding it a really good way that if they're doing something interesting they've got engagement Mm -hmm. but also if they need something so I'm currently growing out um, plants that wouldn't normally be allowed to flower so that some of our scientists can see what the nutrition the pollen is for the bees so they want the bees so things like cabbages which they no one lets flower no no one lets flower so we're letting them flower but they're actually quite beautiful as well so the flowers are gorgeous all of them are I've often had the idea of planting a garden where it's purely vegetables in flower yeah Yeah. Yeah. think of the pollinators it would be crazy and lettuces I mean they look awesome when they go to seed yeah Yeah. Yeah. I mean I've let all my chard seed because I just think yeah. it looks kind of crazy and cool. Yeah. And it's kind of, like funky. It is. And also it lets people know what it looks like when it flowers. Yeah. That's you know, yeah. that's the education point. This is yeah. what it looks like. But also, <laughs> as you're right, the bees absolutely love it. And, mm-hmm. you know, if you start collecting seed, which isn't something I do a lot here, but you, it's good to know what it looks like when mm. it goes. And also how much space. Yeah. I have people that go, I want to collect seed from, as you say, chard. And that like, you do realise how big these things get when they flower. Yeah. <laughs> like they get big. massive. I know. <laughs> so it's, it's a, all good fun. But yeah, let things flower. I think also it helps for people to be able to see the whole cycle of growth. Mm. Yeah. You know, in yeah, general. Yeah. Because yeah. generally we will cut the flower for yeah. the vase or we will like harvest the cabbage before it's flowered. But actually you need to understand mm how it works yeah. the whole cycle of it so. remember at Hampton Court um, two dirty boys uh-huh. yeah that's not the swear word you've still got one to use here today <laughs> Helena um, they had they do the regrowing of the vegetable scraps and they mm. had some leeks in a vase and they'd flowered oh, and they looked look so sexy looks so yeah. pretty oh, aren't they oh my god oh, alliums are just yeah. Yeah. So, so, and, but you know you think of an allium mm. and you think of the lilac-y yeah. balls yeah, you know yeah. that you plant the bulbs for in spring but yeah. allium you know Definitely. leeks are allium family yeah. onions yeah. and they look beautiful that's almost um, oh, sorry we're on a real tangent yeah, here because no, we fine. want it's something else that's but <laughs> let's just make sure that this is tied in a bow um, <laughs> but actually because 
Do you think it's yeah? Because it's important for people to understand that a vegetable is not just the thing that you see that harvest. Yeah, you know, this yes. is actually so a real important. plant. And sometimes we maybe don't have that connection with the fact it's a real plant. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the, and the yeah. fact that it is it's it's an evolution, isn't it? Yeah. Right in front of you. Know, we take the bit that we want from yeah. it. Yeah, But that yeah. plant wants to grow and it wants to grow more. It wants mm, to yeah. see to produce more. We um, don't always see that bit. It's yeah. really important. I mean, considering the time of year, we're coming up to El Christmas. And that's how you swore that is that's yeah. your word, you're the done. Christmas oh, word. No. You're done. I said the C word. You said the no, C word. That's fine. Right. So we are. <laughs> and sprouts are in season. Like sprouts are all the rage. And like one of the things you get hear people saying a lot is they don't realise how big a sprout plant is. They're living <laughs> massive. Yeah. Because yeah. everyone thinks you get these tiny little Brussels sprouts, right? And then they see the size. Yeah. It's like a metre by a metre by the time it's got yeah, going. True. And, you know, then we want all those sprouts for 50p. This is the conversation I have. Like, yeah. when you pay 50p, you just think that plant has been in the ground for yeah, yeah, six, seven months. 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 It's taken up all that space. Yeah. Like, that's it's why... It's quite amazing be... that it can be 50p. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's really important that we see yeah. all the plant and all the kind of facility, but also things like a lot of those allium flowers, they're all edible. Mm-hmm. They're yeah. already tasty. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, I think it's all really valid, but the more people can see the Definitely better. Yeah, I love it. Sorry, we took we took you down a flowering veg hole. Back. <laughs> you were kind of telling us generally about the science garden before then. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, it's fine. So, yeah, so we went with the scientists to either show what they're doing. So we've yeah. done an Ethiopian bed, which is based on some work that our scientists are doing in Ethiopia, looking at farming techniques and how in layman's terms. So a lot of my job is putting it in layman's terms because they do not do that. Um, so <laughs> there's Ethiopia is basically in two halves. One half is basically in famine. The only country that's not at war to be in famine. And the other half is absolutely mm-hmm. fine. The difference is the farming culture. The side that's in famine, very similar to us, big monocultures. I think they actually farm a lot for other countries. A lot of it goes out of the country. The half is doing really well. Big polycultures in like a, an acre or a hectare, they'll grow 400 different crops. So, and not even just, you know, they'll grow three different types of potatoes. If one fails, they'll have another. Mm-hmm. They grow mm-hmm. safflower for oil. <coughs> they grow things to dye their clothes. Like within that, they, they just grow everything they need. So they're more self-reliant. So we can show that by doing a big bed of what they grow. And, you know, I have had a lot of conversations going, did you know castor oil is poisonous? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes, it is if you eat the seed. Don't eat the seed, but, you know, you can make oil out of it. So it's a real kind of way of engaging them what we do. Mm-hmm. But we also look at future foods, which is kind of my real interest. Um, you know, climate change is happening. I don't know what climate change is going to look like in 20 years, but all I can tell you right now is that the weather events are epic. Yeah. You know, either it's 40 degrees or the wind is knocking everything over or yeah. you get torrential rain. Mm-hmm. So we need to find more resilience. And I'm super lucky. I don't have to have an output from my garden. I don't have to make money. I don't have to have a reliable crop. So I've got space to try plants, Mm. see if they'll Mm. grow, see if they'll be tasty. You know, there's no point really putting lots of effort into something if everyone's not going to want to eat it. Mm. Um, So I've got these little patches where I can try foods Mm. and see how that works. Lovely experimental process, definitely. Yeah, and it's great. And I'm trying all sorts of foods and Mm. getting lots of interesting seeds and lots of feedback quite often. So a lot of the foods that we're trying often come from different countries mm. and Q gets people from all over the world who yeah, come over yeah. and it'll trigger their family stories That's or lovely. they'll ask me if I've tried this or got a few chaps last year that told me I'd never grow a yard long bean ever 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 oh. I grew a yard long bean yeah. Yeah. three only three but I did grow one I was they, very proud they did loads of uh, high really? yard long beans Matthew's yeah. amazing really isn't amazing. he yeah, it's, got, it's got the fingers for oh. these things it's very good but who, um, who then takes the stuff and uses it um and cooks with it and experiments in the kitchen. Yeah, Who does so that work? we have uh, several kitchens on site. It's all run by a company called CH and Co. Who we work very much in collaboration. So our chefs will take them and have a go with them and see if they're tasty, see if there's recipes. And it's a real developing thing. So because the kitchen garden isn't massive, uh, it's big enough. It's bigger than everyone's back gardens, but it's not humongous. We might not produce loads of a crop, so Oka, we might get enough for them to do a couple of servings. Mm-hmm. So it's an ongoing process. Mm-hmm. They don't get yeah. to trial with loads and loads of stuff, but you know. But also, they're learning from how to cook with it and kind yeah. of experiment with the recipes of, yeah. of that, yeah. how to make a daily taste yeah. nice. Right? Yeah, they don't want to affect that one yet. That is fundamentally one of the least uh-huh. tasty things I grow. But and yeah. as, I, as I say to people, although they like the flowers, the flowers, the kitchens love yeah. taking the edible flowers, is that if. It's, it's great for us. We all eat what 
mm. what we want. We eat for flavour, right? Yeah. There are people in the world that don't get that option. Yeah. It's a really yeah. calorie really good point. heavy mm. crop. So, you know. Also, would you sit here and if we just discovered potatoes, would you say they taste nice? <laughs> Not the original but ones, no. Really, but would you? Well, I don't know. I don't like potatoes, so maybe I'm biased. But <gasps> you don't eat potatoes. But you do something with knew. potatoes to make them interesting. Like you usually would put some seasoning yeah, or some butter yeah. if you're making mash. Yeah. Potato on its own yeah. is maybe yeah. in the same league yeah. as a dahlia. Yeah. You don't yeah. just you have a jack of potato, it. do you? You exactly. put some stuff yeah. on it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think we'll say love your beans. Oh. <laughs> oh, do we not like beans either? Tuna and cheese. Tuna first. Uh, beans and cheese. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, is it, uh, would it vary between different tubers? Because I know a few years ago, and I don't know if it's just marketing, Lubura mm -hmm. in uh, Switzerland like brought out a range of dahlias that were for their edible tubers. Okay. Did you try those? Were they any Didn't better Didn't try those ones, no, but no. I might do now. <laughs> now you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I think this is the thing about this kind of line of thinking. Loads of people are doing mm. loads of things and you tap into different markets, so I'm always mm. keen to try. Uh -huh. One of our scientists has come up and said he's found a route that he thinks edible that will grow outside, yeah. a type of yam, uh -huh. but not sweet potatoes, um, dyscorea. Oh, the yeah. Japanese one? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But That's so thinks, sticky. Yeah, yeah but he sorry. thinks he's found one that will grow outside in the UK and oh. wants us to have a go That's with. Cool. So What was really interesting when I came for the open day was a compagula with yeah, an edible root. Yeah, yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, it's Campanula um, rapunculus. So apparently the story of Rapunzel is based on this. It's a German... Really? Yeah, apparently in the original version there's, a, there's this thing that's called... Um, I think it's... What's it, what's Rampion, I think, is one of the names for it, but it's a German root, so it's probably very badly translated. Um... <laughs> And apparently it turns up in the story of Rapunzel somewhere. It's this mm. kind of peasant food. So I haven't harvested it yet. And I think it's going to take a few years for it to get big roots. But it's mm. going to be interesting when we dig it up. Yeah, that's um, so exciting. Yeah. I got the seed from Pennards. Always look at Pennards for their uh, oh, exciting yeah, right. They are really great. Yeah. Really yeah. yeah. But then also, like, with a root, like, it's got to be, like, I know this sounds fussy, but you've got to think about it practically. But it's yeah. got to be an easy shape to use. Yeah. An easy shape to peel. Like, yeah. Because ochre, in my opinion, are a faff. Oh, yeah. Jerusalem artichokes, or no, not Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem artichokes. Yeah, Chinese yeah. artichokes. Yeah. Yeah. Chinese, that's yeah. what they yeah. are useless. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so it's kind of like this companion, for example. Like, how big a root are we talking Well, you know I think I mean? it's meant to be sort of relatively big when it gets going. Mm. So I think it's looking to be towards like a small turnip. So it might okay. be fine, but I won't know. You could, uh, you could then select for bigger along the line, yeah. just like potatoes were. But like potatoes, yeah. like the ochre, you know, the Guild of Ochre Breeders, yeah, that's yeah. what they're trying to do. And this is one of the. The Guild of Ochre Breeders. Oh my gosh, it exists. Of there was a girl in the UK. There was a guild of ochre breeders that basically about twenty years ago started breeding them because it's breeding ochre is really sounds complicated. Like a rat band. It sounds like <laughs> the best thing ever. I mean, I love them, and they will send you out. I think they've had to put a stop on it recently, but they will send you out some ochre mm -hmm. uh, with a, a really sexy name like T165 yeah. <laughs> and then you you grow it and you weigh it and you tell them what your results have been and it's That's kind of so cool, citizen science but old school but yeah really That's putting really that cool. energy behind a new crop we have to um, I have we a have question to. before we move on what yeah. about weeds what we say are weeds there's so many mm. edible weeds do I mean, you grow any or yeah I do or? and I get a lot of uh, exciting feedback uh, <laughs> so they are cultivated version of weeds I'll yeah. be honest so in the uh, one of the other areas I'm looking at is leafy crops. So I have a super hot garden. Most leafy crops need too much water in the summer and they bolt because it's just too yeah. hot, it's too stressful. So we're trying some different things in, for leafy crops that we harvest for the kitchens. Dandelions do really, really well. Favourite. For really, but fresh really or good depth. Um, Blanch a little blanche, bit. Yeah. Like, yeah. But actually yeah. even fresh, just a little bit in a mixed salad. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like we're really scared of bitters yeah. as a society. They're good for you. So good. Yeah. But the issue is we've lost our taste. Though, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because we've gone all yeah. sugar in everything. Yeah. So but you know, we're I think kind you of find that Italian kind of palate as much mm. like you know bitter, Campari, yeah. Yeah. kind of espresso. It's, it's very, so good. For I you. think it is genes. Like, but it's also yeah. we've lost it. So the mm. hard end of bitter is poison mm. and I think because we've lost the difference yeah, that's interesting, yeah. because we eat kind of a lot more processed food yeah. we've lost the, know the we don't know the difference so your body just goes bitter bad rather than going mm. this is good bitter that is bad bitter yeah. and I think that because 
we've lost that. But yeah, like dandelion's good. Plantain or yeah. well, stag's horn okay. plantain is yeah. one of my favourite crops. Mm. So it's not quite those plantain sort of leaves you get or plant to go. I'm over. googling as we speak. Yeah, no, please do. <laughs> I harvested it the other day. If I show you, I can't show you a picture because you're a, an audience without a thing. But um, <laughs> uh, so so that's what it looks like. So that's obviously mustard red frills, and that's what the it's like a kind of rocket in some ways. Yeah, but it's yeah. lovely. Yeah, so yeah. it's um, plantigo herba, I think, or plantigo right. minutia. Mm-hmm. It's not quite your plantain that you'd get. It's not your broad. Mm. I have a ton of that on my allotment. But that technically is anyone. I'm not sure how tasty it is. It's a yeah, it seems difference. very rich. Very edible, yeah, but yeah, not, yeah. not yeah. terribly. Yeah, yeah. But so, I do like a dandelion tea. Yeah. Mm. Just with the flowers or root, like dandelion coffee, dandelion yeah. wine, yeah. beer. Yeah, and, like, and a lot of things. people like deep fry their flowers and yeah. bits and pieces. Cool. It's really but tasty. anything deep fried works. Yeah, I've said this to people. <laughs> Deep fry it and put it cheese in it, and you're like, because yeah. everyone always tells me and you, then you eat flowers, and I'm like, you know, I eat yeah. a lot of flowers, but like mostly they stuff the courgette flowers. Isn't that weird? Like, you know, sorry, this is a tangent <laughs> within, within a tangent. This is, we this are, is inception. We are just going <laughs> off the rails. But like, it's so weird how people are so weird about such things like oh you're eating flowers oh, how is that still such a weird thing i don't know because we've been like told to eat processed we've been really food for so many years like we don't we've got to make uh, that reconnection yeah. back to nature and once it's we make so that reconnection funny. we'll start yeah. to understand that and that's i think where i think there's just too much of kind of fear of poison mm. and there's so many you know one of my biggest bugbears recently has been you know the giant hogweed debate like you know everyone is now yeah. terrified of anything that looks like a hogweed yeah. mm. but that's not the case they're so valid for like wildlife I'm yeah. actually literally growing not a hogweed but a plant that looks really similar because I want hoverflies in my garden hoverflies really like umbilifers mm. sadly yeah. umbilifers look like hogweed mm. and people are really scared yeah. but is this social yeah. media yeah. that's done this though because Sorry? social media has had a really good side but also they can make drama around things yeah I you think know. the social media oh umbilifer yeah. <gasps> Bad. You know, it must yeah. be that. Yeah. 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 Most of them and they'll pass depressing. it on, and then, like, you know, someone yeah. with less knowledge will be like, you know, anything that looks like this is poisonous. And, yeah. And then it goes down the line. I think it's yeah. a bit of that, and a bit of uh, a little bit of extremism. And, you know, you, mm. you want to get your story out there. You tend to have to be quite extreme, which doesn't help. You know, mm. I remember you put out seed mixes for wildflowers, and if mm-hmm. there's corn cockle in there, everyone freaks out. Because <laughs> very many, many, many years ago, hundreds of years ago, there was corn cockle um, poisoning because it was in flower, so it was wildflower, it is poisonous, and it got into wheat, and someone died from mm. it. This was hundreds of years ago, mm. and, and one incident. What? Exactly. <laughs> died from it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. so yeah, it's just the sort of slight fear. It's that sensationalism of a story, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. That we're yeah. terrible at as humans. Um, yeah. I'm definitely not suggesting anyone goes out um, fungi <laughs> foraging or edible foraging in any way if no. you don't know what you're looking you for. You ate a fungus the other day that you picked. But I wouldn't most, be that brave. Yeah, but you, there are actually very few deaths from yeah. eating mm. fungi. Yeah. Even mm. the ones that are really extremely yeah. toxic. Don't do it. So I'm totally not saying go mm-hmm. just pick any fungi. But it is extremely rare that someone mm. will pick something, eat it, and even if it's toxic and you get belly aching, you're yeah. not very well, that's horrible, horrible, but the chances of dying then are so, so, so small. So don't do it, uh, you know, yeah. unless you know. But I think we, we have this fear, like, yeah, driven into us from childhood. When you're, when you're brought up in, in the UK, you're kind of like, oh, deadly nightshade, you know, even yeah, the common yeah. name for it is fearful, then it's obviously fungus as well but you know conversely if you grew up in Poland you're actually taught to kind of recognise the mushrooms in a very natural and positive way and then actually use them and go and harvest them and it's just we have that real fear around plants in that way but there's a lot of plants that we grow normally that are poisonous but we turn a blind eye to that (laughs) a giant puffball yeah Yeah. I've got a few giant puffballs growing on the allotment Mm. and I was like first of all when they were starting to grow I was like what is that? <laughs> and then they got a little bit bigger, and I was like, that is definitely mm. giant puffball. And I mean, you can tell because this sponge you cut in into them, yeah. and it looks like a totally sort of thing. I wanted to see when you were last the on only WhatsApp. Thing that it, the, <laughs> the only thing that it could really be is... Um, Eight hours ago? If you cut into it and it's black, then you know that that's not yeah. a puffball. But generally, and we had a really hot, dry summer, so apparently the spores really liked that, and then oh, it cool. rained suddenly. And yeah. so it, anyway, they got really big. And I've got to be honest, I took it home, and I was like so excited, and I cut in to it and I actually didn't eat it on the first night because I was like that is definitely a giant puffball in it. Oh my god, oh my god. It really? must be a giant puffball. Oh. Like there is no but the thing is there is nothing else that looks like a giant no. puffball. Yeah. That's it. 
And but even like momentarily, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. that is one, isn't it? And I, like, I'm happy to try anything That's like funny. that, you know. Anyway, I'm still alive, so yeah. Yeah. Like, well, let's go back to taste because most poisonous things. So even apparently, I've never tasted a poisonous mushroom, thankfully, <laughs> but apparently they have a slight metallic tang. Okay. So I don't take that either as kind okay. of set. But like most things that are poisonous, they're poisonous because uh-huh. they contain toxins uh-huh. and we can taste, taste that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you have to trust your instinct. Yeah. You know, as a human, like we we grew up with all of this nature around us and so we would try something and taste it and it would be awful and you'd go, no, I won't eat that. Yeah, like there's a reason yeah, yeah. for yeah. that. Yeah. Well, I always yeah, find like um, when people are like, worried about plants that are poisonous to dogs or cats, I yeah. think they kind of surely they the animals know. instinctively they know. know. They'll, they'll, yeah. take a, they'll take a little bit and yeah. then yeah, 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 it's yeah. not right. They don't take any yeah, more. But yeah, it's just like we have to just taste we slow down and taste things yeah, that's yeah. kind of one of the things and then i think there's probably a world of things out there we don't eat mm. that oh, we gosh, could so yeah, if yeah, we yeah. just so had a little taste of it well, like Ellen's point out with of it. weeds and things yeah. that seem we're like oh what are they doing there they're yeah. actually really useful yeah. to us like, we're really cultivating useful. the plants but actually yeah. nature's already providing you with yeah. a ton of nutrition mm-hmm. and yeah. stuff and there. the wilder plants they're more resistant to climate change because right. they are ever evolving so when we have cultivars we have to keep that pure, we, you know, to keep it sellable. You know, mm-hmm. it has to be continue being a dark red tomato that's got a thick skin for transportation. Yeah, yeah. So we keep them really pure. Wild plants, every single offspring is evolving and it's evolving to the circumstances it finds itself in. So the guys that have managed to deal with this 40 degree heat, they're going to have been really successful. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. the, its neighbour that kind of slightly different, that's the thing about wild plants, they're all slightly, slightly different to each other. If he didn't do so well, then he's not going to have offspring this year. Mm-hmm. So that's the thing about wild plants. And we actually have done work here. I did. We were part of a scheme called the Crop Wild Relatives Scheme, uh, which was worldwide, and scientists from all over the, the world basically went out to, cre- to collect the seed of wild plants and cultivated. So... I was really lucky. We managed to get hold of some of the carrot seed and I grew these wild carrots next to our cultivated carrot. Now, the root, not particularly pleasant, but they grew much more successfully. Mm. Uh, The ones from Portugal did much better than anywhere else. I can tell you that from a one-year trial. And then the thing is what we can do now is if there are plants like carrots having issues, we can take some of the properties Mm. from the wild plants and put them back in through breeding um, so wild plants are really important to the future mm-hmm. of our food because right. they are more resistant, as well as you say, being more nutritious. So yeah, that's less oh fear. God. Less this fear. Is, <laughs> this is so interesting. Um, we we will just come back to the garden, though. <laughs> um, Elena, this podcast is excellent. We've only asked you two questions off the is list. Like, this, is a, this is amazing, oh. but we're not going anywhere. <laughs> Hello, it's Emma here. I'm a gardener and presenter and it is an absolute honour to be asked to contribute to Michael and Ellen's amazing podcast. I've been a fan of it for many years. Honestly, I am over the moon. Now, it's a really dreary autumnal afternoon. The rain is absolutely thrashing down outside and you can probably hear the wind howling in my fireplace as well. I had planned to be out in the garden today doing a little bit of autumn sewing, but instead I'm curled up with a blanket and a cup of tea and I feel like I should probably have an apple crumble as well. It's an apple crumble sort of day. But I really wanted to try and sow today some hardy annuals, some sweet peas, some calendula, some Orlea grandiflora. I hadn't really done much autumn sowing before until last year. Now, I had one of those teeny tiny flimsy greenhouses, as I like to call it. You know, those like funny little plastic ones that you can get from your local garden centre. So I sowed a load of hardy annuals. I was really excited. Some calendula officinalis, some sweet peas peas, some Orlea grandiflora. I was really hoping for a garden full of lovely blooms that I could cut and pop in little vases, you know, to create little posies for when guests come to stay. So off I went, sowing my lovely little seeds and popping them snugly in my teeny tiny flimsy greenhouse, hoping that they'll germinate super soon. But 
then the storm came. I don't know if you remember. At the end of last year, we had that absolutely horrific storm and my poor little teeny tiny flimsy greenhouse got absolutely well and truly battered. Sadly, it was no more. And so were my seedlings. Oh, they were absolutely destroyed. I found them in a complete sort of state all over my patio. There was compost everywhere and tiny little seeds that were desperately trying to germinate. I was so, so upset, especially to have lost my greenhouse, my only greenhouse. But then I thought, well, actually, I was very privileged and lucky to have had a greenhouse, even if it was a teeny tiny flimsy one, because a lot of people don't have the space or the resources. And I thought, well, surely there must be a way of sowing the seeds without a greenhouse. So I came up with an experiment. I called it my milk carton sweet peas. I basically took an old milk carton, obviously it was empty, rinsed it all out. I cut it in half, but kind of left the back sections so that it could flip open. I cut some little drainage holes in the bottom, filled it up with some compost that I'd sieved just to make sure there weren't any great big lumps or bits of bark in there. And then all I did was poke some sweet pea seeds in. I moistened them a little bit, just watered them ever so slightly, closed the lid, and then I left them outside. And that is the crucial part. I didn't pop them on a windowsill. I didn't put them in a propagator. Obviously, I had no greenhouse, so I left them outside. Now, it took them a little bit longer to germinate than they would have done if they were in a greenhouse, but they germinated and they were absolutely fine. And I checked on them every single day just to see how much they were growing. Obviously, over the winter, they were really, really slow growing. But actually, that's what we want because we don't want them to suddenly grow really quickly, put on that luscious growth. It was really interesting as well because at one point, I actually left them outside overnight with the lid off. I forgot to close the little lid. And what happened? But they actually got frostbite. (laughs) My poor little sweet pea seedlings actually froze. I went out the next morning. I couldn't believe it. They were covered in little ice crystals and my heart broke. But I'd forgotten that sweet peas are hardy, hence hardy annuals. They're really tough. They can cope with a little bit of frost. Um, And believe it or not, they just miraculously recovered. They were absolutely fine. I planted them out. It's sort of the end of March, beginning of April. I obviously made sure they had a lot of good compost around them. I really, really watered them in well. And honestly, I've never had such success with sweet peas in my life. I think the fact that, you know, I sort of treated them mean to keep them keen (laughs) meant that I had so many more flowers. It was incredible. I think leaving them outside really, really toughened them up. It meant that they were absolutely fine when I planted them out. They didn't mind the cold. They didn't mind a bit of wind. They didn't mind the rain. They didn't even mind the drought when it was really, really hot in the summer. And they just kept producing flowers after flowers after flowers. Honestly, I said it once, I'll say it again. I've never had so much success with sweet peas in my life. Now, It could have been a fluke. It could have been beginner's luck, but I'm putting it down to my milk carton sweet pea method. So why not give it a go? Just take a milk carton, cut it in half, make sure there's some drainage holes, fill it with compost, poke some sweet peas and hey presto, hopefully next year your house will be full of sweet pea fragrance. You've mentioned climate change, obviously, yeah. and, you know, changing environment and how our plants, seeds, everything has to be adaptable, all of that. Um, but how do you garden? Like, I'm assuming it's all sustainable. Like, what are your methods to cultivate in, in the garden? I mean, I think gardening's generally quite sustainable. Um, it's often put out that it's not. Um, and I guess there are things like spraying and whatnot that are a lot less sustainable. We don't do it in the kitchen garden. Uh, the only thing I've ever sprayed is a foliar feed that's made out of comfrey. That's okay. We're allowed to do that. It's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, things like no dig are really good because I don't actually have to feed my plants yeah. uh, because the soil's really healthy. We have a kind of a closed system in terms of uh, compost is all made on site. Again, we're really lucky that we can do that. Um, I don't use single-use plastics. That's the only thing I really try not to do. I do use plastics. But if I'm going to use them, they need to live for a long time. So things like I've just got some new netting for my brassica cage. 
I've got the woven netted plastic because that lasts much longer than the molded netted. And it's those small decisions that you can make. Um, if I could, I'd love to save seed. That's a really sustainable way of doing it. I don't have the facilities here actually to do that, um, which I know sounds weird because we have a massive seed bank. That's quite a long way away from me. Um, that's a really good way of doing it. I'm really looking towards water sustainability. Um, this summer was hard yeah really hard and water isn't an endless supply because the water mm. we use is treated it comes it, you know it takes energy to get the water to us it mm. isn't magic so things like mulching things i've just changed my irrigation to sort of a leaky hose system so the water goes straight into the roots so i'm not using so much i am pretty harsh with my plants i don't give them a lot of water ever you need to train them right you need I to do. Yeah. i yeah. don't yeah. no you don't need to like yeah. they you need they, to get the deeper roots so they look yeah. after yeah. themselves more. you do yeah. and they actually taste better i think mm. sometimes like things like peppers and whatnot quite like being stressed mm. Yeah. Mm. any plant yeah. whose flavor comes from um pest control yeah. so peppers yeah. herbs they all produce more of those kind of oils when they're a bit stressed. Yeah. So you actually get a better flavour. Yeah. Might not get so much. Yeah. So water sustainability is something we're really working on. Um, one of the great things about getting rid of the grass paths, as well as my hatred of edging, is that we're not using fossil fuels to mow. And yeah. the paths are all uh, porous, which you have to be. So the water just trickles down. It takes a little while, but it basically ends up back in the beds. Right. So it all goes back in. Um, whereas before it was, we had to mow. I got us down to fortnightly because I really don't like mowing. Um, I really don't like mowing. It's not fun. <laughs> and, um, yeah, we, I mean, the, the paths are just very unsustainable. Obviously, grass is actually turf and grass are great, you know, but I couldn't do no mow may or else no one would be able to access the kitchen garden. Yeah. So yeah. it wasn't super sustainable. But, yeah, just things like I don't use loads of little white labels. I write directly on the 90Ms. You know, there's just all these little things that you can do. Mm. These are all things you can do at home. Mm. Literally Absolutely. everything you've said is yeah. what every mm. gardener can do at home. Oh, yeah. I just said writing on the pot. Yeah, That's so cool. I mean, it's, yeah. it's not loads, but when I do, yeah. I know that everyone does different amounts, but I mean, I go through, I've got all my pots to wash still this year, so I've got a rather large pot pile. <laughs> oh my gosh, I think I've got about 3,090 Oh my still. god. So if you can imagine, every single one of them would have needed a white label in mm, but yeah, I put yeah. one in a basket for example yeah. the other thing I do is I steal all the mushroom crates from the restaurant because they fit 12 9cm pots in perfectly nice so we reuse things here as much as we can that's really cool um, yeah. and the great thing is if there's anything we can't use we've got a great community garden here well community leader and she'll send them out to community gardens so anything leftover plants mm -hmm. um, any so last when we cleared out the kitchen garden most of that went out to community gardens via her mm -hmm. so everything gets reuse where we can like you know we're not in a climate where we can get rid of stuff no mm. we shouldn't be getting rid of stuff <laughs> now talking more about like crops for the future yeah um kind of this is really a two-pronged question really kind of what crops do you think we'll be using to eat in years mm -hmm. to come and yeah. ones that are standouts from what you've trialed here but also ones to use to fuel as well because there's a lot of different fuel crops out there and there was um there's a grower just outside Norwich, isn't there? Mm -hmm. That are growing miscanthus mm -hmm. for crops. Oh, really? Which is yeah, quite yeah. Terra Vista, I think yeah. it is. Mm. Yeah. Love to get them on the podcast sometime. <laughs> yeah. but, but also, so you're listening. <laughs> I think Botanic Garden, where was it? Maybe somewhere in China where they had about 12 different fuel crops as mm. well. So talk us through kind of those two kind of elements of how we will be interacting with plants in the future. Cool. I mean, yeah. I think food crops... Um, I do think we'll still be seeing some of our regulars. I can't yeah. see us not growing tomatoes and mm. cucumbers. Everything will be outside. Mm -hmm. I mean, I grow everything outside. Okay. Um, I think we'll have to have more variety in the shops. So mm -hmm. I think there will be times when you can't get potatoes and you will have to put up with daily achievers yeah. or something yeah. akin. Mm. I think there'll be a lot less of us choosing what's out there and more yeah. of us going and seeing what's there. You know, we're mm -hmm. very lucky, really, at the minute. Mm. We sure yeah. feel very, very lucky. It's very easy to forget that, and we yeah. do. So yeah. 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 I think we'll see more fruit crops as well. Because actually, for me, it's okay. the non-fruiting crops that have been... So, you know, tomatoes, cucumbers, all those things have actually been fine. Mm -hmm. It's your leafy crops, it's your cabbages and brassicas okay, yeah, that, yeah. especially during the summer, struggle. But no one eats the greens anyway. Oh, uh, <laughs> let me tell you. Can I tell you about let me my... Tell you. <laughs> can, I, can I tell you about my celery crop this year? No. So I like to have a celery juice <laughs> in the listen. morning. No. no. Uh, and I've got really accustomed to it now because obviously the flavour. Yeah, yeah. 
Chinese, I had the Chinese um, pink celery last year and it actually tasted a little bit better yeah. than the normal green celery. But anyway, yeah. I have a normal green celery crop this year and I had loads of them. And then um, in the summer, I pushed to the limit what could what needed water yeah yeah um, intentionally yeah and i would watch everyone around watering watering so i go <laughs> dig and it's all mulched yeah quite heavily mulched mm -hmm. and that's definitely helped yeah and uh the celery crop the the foliage was burnt like right. and i i think it got watered once a week and actually i was away for about three weeks right in the middle of the heat wave and a neighbor watered it occasionally um not deeply just like, <laughs> you know like probably yeah. shouldn't have bothered watering it yeah. um but the foliage was all burnt mm. and uh someone said to me that you know that hasn't done very well has it and i was like well do you know what i'm leaving it i'm gonna see what happens yeah. mm -hmm. and, like being shady uh well you know <laughs> some people like to be a bit Bit competitive yeah. which is really yeah. odd but anyway there it is and I've left it and then I left it a bit longer and I thought I, I harvested some and it was it was a bit bitter yeah, yeah. um but fine in a drink anyway then we had all of this rain they are amazing yeah. the flavor mm. is amazing it's better than any shop bought celery yep. you can taste the celery but it's not bitter all of the foliage is recovered and someone else might have pulled that out yeah and composted mm. it mm. do you know what I mean? I, but i left it and yeah. it was it is absolutely perfect it's very cool. yeah it's perfect. fine and we might have to put with slightly more bitter crops if it keeps yeah. getting hotter we might and have to get used to that fine. It's you, okay. you're, you're mm. you know you yeah. get used to that those different flavors oh. but mm. it, it's absolutely literally the most perfect <laughs> celery i can't tell you this is celery it's a water it needs water it needs water but yeah. it didn't no no i it's they they will adapt and thrive and and if we let them but yeah. we're too quick to pull yeah. well, out we them, yeah. because yeah. we're humans yeah. Yeah. and we think we have to be in control yeah but nature's in control it's all fine oh, nice. i know i have um so most of my brassicas are netted but in this little urban bed i've got i'm not netting stuff because it's not always very easy and the little green kales just got mullered by pigeons. We got mullered, I mullered. Love them. absolutely <laughs> mullered. There was nothing like mullered. They were, but they're growing back yeah. because they didn't get the growing point. Yeah. The kales come back. The pigeons are interested in the stuff. As an interesting side point, the red kale didn't get touched, which I've always said pigeons can't see red leaf crops, and this is more and more becoming true. Mm -hmm. So they haven't got good eyesight. So the, the difference in colour between a red leaf and the soil, yeah. they can't see oh, that as oh well as the green leaf and the cool. soil. Yeah. yeah, it's why they go for like big monocultures and why polycultures tend to be healthier, especially yeah. with pigeons, because they just they kind of they're very bright i know they can mm. bounce on things but their eyesight's actually quite poor right. so yeah that's, that's good. But yeah you can tell that when you're driving along and they can't see you coming <laughs> <laughs> i know i know it's like why have you not moved yet <laughs> <laughs> they are quite stupid what color is your car really <laughs> It is like a brownie green. Yeah, they probably can't see they can't so well. See it. Yeah. <laughs> the contrast is not high. They're not good. They're not good. But yeah, I mean, I do. I don't. I'm not 100 sure what the future is going. I think one of the things we'll mm -hmm. see difference in is types cultivars. So mm -hmm. we're planting a load of apples. I'm growing some that are really new. Mm -hmm. So um, that have very low chilling hours, which means they don't need a lot of cold over winter. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to grow them directly next to some heritage varieties from the UK that we're growing here, actually in the Georgia period um and i think we'll see that the ones from south africa or the ones that have been bred in the last 10 years are gonna just go through the roof so i think we'll see cultivars coming in that are bred from other countries in a weird way with climate change we're slightly lucky because there are other countries hotter than us so we can mm. basically mm. see what they're doing it's yeah. the guys that are already hot though yeah what happens there <laughs> so yeah. i have to tell you something cool in a minute but yeah, can wait. Yeah. Can wait. no no it's fine Sorry. but yeah i think we'll see different cultivars i mean i do worry for like our average orchard will we be growing peaches outside and apricots more than you know I can't see us ever getting into coffee because we're yeah, always going to have a winter here. But I think there'll be more. I have of to that. tell you two no, cool no. things. Oh go, 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 go for it. Store in the no, carry on. Honestly, no, no. I, can I, I think it's really hard for me to. <laughs> yeah. I find it really tricky because next year it could rain and be cold all year. Yeah, so I exactly. think yeah, we will yeah. just see a, a larger variety. I think it's worth preparing regardless. It's yeah. always worth preparing, mm. and I think it's always worth just growing a lot of stuff and being okay with a crop failing because. Yeah. The only way for us to be resistant is to grow as many different. So mm -hmm. in spring, we should be growing heat lovers and the things that will manage with the cold, yeah. mm -hmm. knowing that one of those crops is probably going to fail, but at yeah. least we'll have a crop. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Something out there in your garden will eat the crop that's failing anyway. Mm -hmm. Or the compost. So, so it's Maybe not... the crops you already grow to grow them harder. 
Yeah, yeah well. you're not wasting yeah, yeah. it because yeah. it all goes back into the natural cycle mm-hmm. one yeah. way or the other. So I think anyway. just yeah, more yeah. variety and more experimentation, and it's a really mm-hmm. big conversation between scientists, horticulturalists, farmers, and chefs, mm-hmm. and the supermarkets because yeah. all those people need to be involved in mm-hmm. and and the buyers, yeah. you know. So I think it's cool. yeah, I think more diversity is for, for it. crops. How about fuel? You've got a few crops of fuel here. Not as well. well, they're actually the Ethiopian ones for yeah. the guys. So I, it's not something uh-huh. I have a lot of knowledge on, but uh-huh. I think it's more kind of oils and things that we're looking okay. at. But um, I do know that sunflowers are looking more hopeful. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, it's not something I have a large, okay. large bit of sort of something that's really interesting though, because yeah, yeah. we can get a lot of stuff from you know they they have these amazing oils they have amazing mm-hmm. products in there that we should be using so mm-hmm. I think it's cool. an area for experiment, experimentation yeah I've got two really cool things to tell you about Helena yeah. uh, firstly I was in Portugal last week uh, speaking at a trade show and yeah. I was really honoured to spend a day, a day with a really cool guy he's on Instagram called the Lisbonian Gardener okay. and he is doing experiments in Lisbon because this is a dry climate right yeah mediterranean so he is growing rainforest kind of tropical crops so bananas strelitzia pineapples as well and he's got this garden like this hidden garden in the middle of lisbon like even in the tourist area but it's just on the uh kind of on the precipice of a ruin and he took me there and it was amazing because he had these pineapple crops he had coffee there as well growing in a mediterranean (laughs) climate but he wanted to prove that you could do this because you've got that dense canopy you've kind of got this you're almost creating that microclimate by having that range of plants there and the pineapples he had were not cultivated these were the original (laughs) that he'd actually took an offset from South America and brought it back. That's yeah. really cool. It's really cool. He gave me one as well. Oh, you can like... buy it off me if you want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. We're trading in uh, things now. So, so coffee as well was yeah. there, which was really brilliant. It hasn't fruited yet. No, of course, no. possibility might be there. But the other thing I want to tell you about was at Floriada, mm-hmm. which is this big Dutch uh, kind of. Um, have you been there in the no, summer? No, no. Yeah. And it's like uh, like an exhibition of uh, horticulture from around the world. And there's a pavilion from UAE. Yeah. And they are doing the most brilliant education in saltwater crops. Oh, cool. Yes. Very cool. I'll, I'll have to send you all the screenshots of all the like, info boards because yeah, yeah. it's really like interesting. Yeah, Samfire, that yeah. kind of thing. We actually Definitely. have Samfire. And I, really it's cool. cool. And I but even get... beyond that, other yeah. stuff was really Sunfire, very interesting. Samfire, it's like it always provokes yeah. people's interest, but I have some growing. Yeah. It's not as complicated as Not at yeah. all. Yeah. It's, no, it's, it's, it's salty crops. It's like in yeah. water, and I put salt in the water, so mm. it takes well, up I, salt. I mean, if you ask me, the amount of lime scale that comes through my hose pipe, I don't need to put salt in it. You know, it's doing fine. It's doing fine. But yeah, no, I think this It's so interesting. And there's yeah, a lot we haven't really explored. Mm-hmm. You're absolutely right. And that's how we learn from other countries around the world. How exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I have that's to show you both these, yeah. these pictures. It sounds amazing. It's really cool. And it's great when people are putting themselves out there and trying it. And, and our job is to kind of mm. not judge. And, yeah. and yeah, yeah, for, yeah. I think the real kind of message I always trying to give them in here is failure is a learning point it's not a failure of course, you know, sure. like yeah. things totally. are going to go you need to wrong. fail to know how to move forward yeah but that's the same as in life like yeah. I don't think gardening's any different if you do something doesn't work out you kind of no. try something different and you know? I don't you know if it doesn't work I don't I mean, occasionally things disappear and no one knows it's gone wrong, but I'll just put a big... I've got these handwritten signs and I'll just say, you know, last year we got blight. Mm-hmm. Everyone got blight. Mm-hmm. Uh, but rather than... I remember yeah. you said when we were on the... Signs the everyone yeah. got blight. Yeah. She said blight always happens on the weekend. Yeah, always. <laughs> because it always happens on, like, a Friday night so that Monday I come back to a really smushed crop. Like, always. It never happens on a Monday morning. I'm like, oh, that's the start of blight. I can get on top that's of this. Really it always science. happens. not always. It always happens on a Friday night. <laughs> no. Oh, brilliant. So cool. Honestly, but the, rather than say, oh, you know, there were some crops we left behind because there were some blight resistant ones that were doing okay. They only got an extra two weeks of them, but they did. So every single one, I just, you know, said, this is what's happened and we got it too and it's okay. Uh, and yeah. then, you know, don't panic. It happens. But yeah, no, it was always, it's always Friday night. So Monday morning's always really grim. Friday night, blight night. <laughs> always, oh, always. Do you have cool. any tips for small space gardeners at home? Because obviously so many people live in urban environments yeah. So they have like a balcony or just a patio or a small garden. Yeah. What can listeners do in their own garden? So we're actually experimenting with this because I, when I, one of the phases when I really got into growing, I was in pots. I was renting, and landlords do not like you digging up their garden, which is annoying because it's mainly just turf. Yeah. <laughs> but I understand you it. You can make it nicer. Uh, you're really good. I can add value to your house. Uh, so it's pots. So. 
One of the things people really need to experiment with, I think, is looking for dwarf cultivars. There are a lot of breeders out there that are breeding. We're growing a really beautiful little butternut squash called Butterbush, which is small, uh, grows in a relatively large pot, um, but you can get three or four fruits off each one. There's dwarf nice. broad, uh, broad beans and French beans and runner beans. They're all coming in dwarf types. We've even got a dwarf okra this year. That's actually done better than the normal okra. So, mm-hmm. okay. you know, it's all out there. The other thing we've tried is square foot gardening, yeah. which has done really well. When I first made my little square foot grid, I was like, Mel Bartholomew, <laughs> I, know you, I know you're not with us anymore, but what have you got me doing? You know, so Mel, Mel Bartholomew, he sort of started it all in America, and I was just like, this man's just got me, do- I don't know, I don't know. But it has been so productive. Yeah. And so this year we've just trialed it, and next year my student is going to like calculate what we get out of this tiny space. Because uh-huh. we grow so traditionally, we grow in long lines. Mm-hmm. The only reason to grow in long lines is so your tractor can go along and mm-hmm. harvest. You don't need to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Around mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot of horticulture comes from agriculture because yeah. there's money in agriculture, so that's where all the kind of experimentation goes on. Mm-hmm. Um, so we trickle it down. That's why we've rotated all these years. That's why we dig our soil over because on a mm-hmm. big scale, that's sure. how you do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's all trickled down. So it's fine. That's all good knowledge. But then it's understanding why you do it and how you can change it. So if you're growing in a small space, just whack everything in and like have mm-hmm. a go. Polyculture is great. You can pop in basically everything growing underneath everything else yeah um, Make use of all of the space. All of vertical growing. Polyculture yeah. is like more. Well, it's like polyamory for plants, right? Yeah, that's the one. That's <laughs> totally where we're going it. with that. It's like oh. a really nice little lounge. Is that ah. a club? No. Ah, cool. It's just growing everything within each other. It's, it's got a name. Like some, it's similar to the potager, similar to cottage yeah, gardening. Yeah. We give it lots of names, but it's basically growing. <laughs> Everything all in a higgledy piggledy mm. mess, but I think it's really beautiful. It's better for yeah. biodiversity. Oh, it's better for the crops. I've got a border with the polyculture thing going on where we've got sunflowers and aubergines and chard and all sorts of beautiful things all intermingled. I literally gave a chap called Andy, uh, who was wor- working with me at the time, I just gave him loads of plants and, he's, and I said, just whack them out. I said, it doesn't matter how it's done, just pop them out. Basically, mm-hmm. we had like a week till there's openings. There's a little mm. bit of that going on. <laughs> and it's really like the aubergines in there are much healthier than the aubergines that are in lines because they do get a little bit of m- mildew but mm. in the polyculture area one might get it but it's not going to get all of them because mm. they're so far scattered I had the best idea of my lot <laughs> next year oh my gosh <laughs> I'm just going to go for it just throw the seeds in one way put them in anyway. what the neighbours say <laughs> they will they will question it I love they that at this point should. Ellen is always like do my allotment neighbours listen to the podcast Oh, I hope they, do. They, will, they will question it. But they should question gonna it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. There are... the, oh, but this is interesting because this is where I think the rose is very generational, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it and is easier. Understandably yeah. so. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, it, it is easier to like know what it is. So like, as a start, as you, if you're starting out, rows are really useful because mm. you know that if it's not in that row, it's probably a weed. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really easy when you've been gardening for ages. I just thought of something. Sorry. No, that's fine. Right. Yeah, I going to say, we're not in school now, love. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like rose is useful, uh-huh. but yeah, yeah. like once you kind of get this kind of more confident with mm. what it is, then yeah. you don't need to. You can pop them in a small space. That's There's cool. some really cool polyculture mixes where you do literally just put the seed down, and they've developed it so that the radish, you know, they've got radishes in there, they've got carrots, they've got squash, mm. and you take the radishes out first, mm-hmm. you know, and then you take the next thing out. In the end, you basically got these larger crops. It's not something I've ever tried. Mm. It's really interesting. I'm totally cool trying it. <laughs> I'm totally gonna do it. <laughs> that um, excites me. <laughs> I remember because um, I was working at Thompson Morgan for like twenty years, and yeah. we did some little kind of experiment once. We called it into sowing. Yes. And this is when we were like putting beetroot um, and no, maybe better examples like carrots and nigella in the same mm-hmm. kind of thing because yeah. then you had vegetables that looked pretty yeah, at yeah, the yeah. same time. Yeah. Yeah, and that's quite a nice. It's thing. all the same beetroot sort of thing. with linum, for example. Yeah. Linum. Yeah. And it's, we eat with our eyes. Yeah. You know, we garden with our eyes. Yeah. And if you've got a small space, it does need to look pretty yeah, yeah, if, I, if I had a tiny space I'd probably only grow herbs and edible flowers yeah. because yeah. they're beautiful mm-hmm. you get they're quite abundant yeah, yeah. Um, the one other thing I'm just my crop of the year this year is actually really good for people with small spaces and it's Malabar spinach oh, or poisag, yeah. which I think you've seen yeah. and I keep going on about it great thing is, is it grows up 
Mm. So it's a vertical, and I think vertical mm. growing when you've got small space is really yeah. important. Mm. And this Thank thing you. has keeps giving and giving and giving. And I even went into a little pop up shop in Spitalfields, and they're selling it as a house plant. Really? They've got it like um, oh. over a little kind of archway oh. kind of thing. Oh, those so, hipsters! Oh my god! <laughs> well, I know, and the price they were selling it for. I, I mean, this is the old lady in me going, and the northerner in me going, uh-huh. oh. Oh, I could I could have told you that for um, 50p. <laughs> it's like, oh, Helena, no, don't become that person. But it is beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And you can bring it in in the winter, it turns out. But it, it, it feels flowers. weird to, uh, like, something like a climber, it already feels in my head, like, quite decorative. Yeah. Like, and then to pick the leaves off something that you're climbing up, because you usually use something to climb to yeah, scream, yeah. but then suddenly you're picking the leaves off it feels weird it feels weird but honestly yeah. like this year it's done so it does need a hot climate mm. so but most people you know are living more in cities they have the warmth mm. and it will get going really fast mm. and it does climb up but it is really really yeah. great and if you really got brave you could climb it up sweet corn yeah. you'd have to be very brave to do that oh. but you know you can go up against a wall or on a balcony yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can yeah. even go right along the edge of the you know if you want to mm. cover your balcony That's with it because cool. it is a climber or in a hanging basket or in a hanging basket you're going to come hanging down, down. Yeah. I, it's my it's crop of the year the yeah. chefs really like That's it because cool. it directly tastes like spinach so yeah mm. that was very That's cool. yeah. oh my god this is oh my god <laughs> <laughs> this podcast is far too long. It is. I've got one more question, which yeah. is a question we actually asked. I don't know if you're going out and about and look at new varieties. We were with ProVeg in mm-hmm. Cambridge uh, a couple of years ago. Uh-huh. And we asked them because, you know, for me, I've worked with hybrids for years. Mm. But then there's this kind of movement with heritage veg. And mm-hmm. it's kind of like, and almost on Instagram, and Ellen, you certainly see this, people are like, <gasps> it's a hybrid. Oh, gosh. How do you feel about that, Helena? So here's how I feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> I have strong opinions. You might tell it like you could use your swear word here. No, I don't need one. to. Yeah. I said the C word. Though, you did. Yeah, you yeah. Drop the C bomb in no, the middle of September. No more opportunity for you. <laughs> no. So I love heritage vegetables. I think there's so much validity in them. I think they're great. But we also have to remember that people are starting out yeah. and F1s yep. and well-bred yep. vegetables they're reliable mm-hmm. and you know like people if it doesn't work in the first year they might not come back to growing mm-hmm. yeah. that would be really sad yeah. yeah. and sometimes these guys that you know they breed for what we're growing in so heritage varieties are great self-safe stuff is great but these guys are actually really really working towards the climate we're working in mm-hmm. I have a lot of seeds from Burpee UK yeah. I think that the work they're doing is really interesting because he's really looking at what will grow in the UK. Mm. So don't dismiss them. I mm. understand that there is this kind of like, oh, yeah, kind of it's the worst thing ever, but it's not. It's yeah. not. It's so useful to it's have something that works. Problem. This is the hogweed effect, isn't yeah, it? No? Yeah, 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 it really is. And there are some companies out there that do use it for evil, yeah. but the majority of breeders who are mm. making F1s, who are yeah. making, they're doing it so we've got food to eat. Yeah. And that fundamentally is a, is a good thing. And to give thing. us the confidence to grow yeah. the food that we also, want to exactly. eat. Exactly. The heritage seeds, as the climate changes, some of those are not going to adapt yeah. to the yeah. No, and some of them, yeah. from really far back, might come back as something really useful, which is why it's really important to keep them going. And, yeah. you know, like, we're growing things like, um, like sweet potatoes. Well, they were growing them way back in Tudor times, right. and then we forgot right. about them, we brought them back. So there's validity in both. Yeah, mm. but I'm not anti F ones. Yeah, I'm not yeah, anti hybrids yeah. because <clears throat> it's just people working to try and help us out. Yeah. So because that social media hysteria and it's it's so funny because uh, I don't know when I was working more in the industry at Thompson Morgan, social media didn't exist. So no, all the no, stuff we did, yeah. like I think nowadays, if I was showing all the new plants we introduced or this and that, people would be like, "We don't need new plants. We don't want this. We don't want that." I think really, they, they feel this controlled is the because problem. you can't yeah. save it. There is this mm. feeling of a supply chain control. You have yeah. to go back to the supplier to get it, and there's yeah. that that sort of slight rebellion. And I totally get that. I yeah. you know there is part of me oh, I have to go and buy new seeds, and not everyone can afford seeds. Yeah, they're not cheap yeah, yeah. Yeah. but you can gain them much more cheaply now I do understand where people are coming from but mm. I also think there's so but much but so many own veg seed like it's like are people really likely to do that anyway well, in the future I we might have yeah. to yeah. but yeah. having a bit of both I think I is think the so. best way yeah. forward yeah. It's, it's like totally. monoculture isn't it <laughs> yeah. you know don't just have one thing try yeah. lots of different well, I've grown light resistant tomatoes next to my heritage tomatoes again 
in case we got blight, I was really interested to see. Mm. I'd been playing around with grafting tomatoes, so grafting onto new mm. rootstocks, but heritage types. My manager wants me to see if I can do a family ch- tomato. Oh, you can easy. Oh, gosh, You yes. need to talk to Bacon Camp <laughs> in Holland. Honestly, it will help you because we made, like, the egg and chips plant and the, yeah, yeah, uh, we yeah. did the family with the stuff and you can do it, honestly. Yeah. No, tomatoes are yeah. super yeah, easy yeah, yeah, to graft. Yeah. My yeah. manager gets we a bit excited. We did it once, didn't we? Have you done it? We yeah, did it we with sellotape. Oh, OK. I it yeah. worked. Uh, I'm really, yeah. I, the first year I tried it, I was surprised. Yeah. They do look a bit weird when the roots start appearing from Elephrine Centre. Uh, it's a bit yeah. like, really. But, but they do, totally, they do work. It yeah. totally but, yeah. works, yeah. But yeah. is that a way of making the heritage better? But the family is possible as well. Well, yeah, so that's what, that's what Martin mix, said. But mix species? Because with the family, you could have a roasted veg plant. Tomato, pepper. Are you going to be back this time next year? Yeah. Like, I can see this. Honestly. Come back in April and you can help me make them. Yeah. <laughs> I do we completely yeah. agree with you. And the process yeah. is easy and kids yeah. love it. You know, again, engaging kids, it's yeah. really easy yeah. to engage them with F1s, a little bit yeah, easier. Yeah, another, like, another thing that we have But also the Frankenstein plants. Oh well. my gosh, yeah. And they anything ugly. Um, <laughs> they love the ugly plants. A bit of wonky bitch is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Uh, this has been so fabulous. I know. I don't want it like, ever to end. <laughs> But it's lunchtime, guys. Come um, on. Yeah. We, we, oh. Like honestly, we could <laughs> chat for ages, couldn't we? And delve in even even deeper to all of the topics we've been talking about. But it's been so interesting. So Definitely. thank you so much no, thank for you. coming on the podcast and like spending this time with us. And I know that our allotmenteers are going to love this episode <laughs> for sure. Cool. Thank, cool. thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Ding to the dong. <laughs> Launching on the 6th of October, you can find out even more about the Royal Botanic Gardens Q by listening to the second series of their podcast called Unearthed Journeys into the Future of Food. Sounds delicious. Big up, big up, energy crew, plant energy crew at that. What is happening? It's Daily here from the Jungle Club, based in Worcester. We've got another location in Birmingham as well. I hope you're doing good. And if you're not doing good, well, hopefully after you've been listening to this podcast, you'll feel a bit better. Nice one, Ellen and uh, Mike, for um, bringing me on board. I'm sure you're all reading uh, Mike's new book. Um, I wonder where they're all put. <laughs> well, one of them was in our shop, which by now you'll probably know. Anyway, <laughs> lovely book that. Can't wait to get into it as well. And cheers, Mike, for sending me one. Um, so we're a houseplant shop. We're a specialist houseplant shop based in Worcester. We've got another location in Birmingham, as I just said. And I just wanted to do something a little bit different. We will. I, I'm going to be coming on doing a couple of segments here and there, but... Um, I didn't want to come on and just go on about plant care. I think, you know, what I wanted to do is basically I want everyone to close their eyes. Everyone close your eyes. If you listen to this podcast, close your eyes. Go on, even you who doesn't want to close your eye, close your eyes. I'm doing it now. Close your eyes. I want to I want to give you a sort of a audio, <laughs> basically a three minute audio book of coming into the shop. So I want your eyes closed and I want you to get the full audio experience. You walk into the shop, you're in Worcester, you walk into the shop, you've just found one of the best plant shops in the West Midlands, if not the best, bar our other shop, yeah? And you've just walked in, you've been greeted by the lovely staff, that's probably me, going, hello, how are you getting on? All right, yeah, sound, yeah, good, nice one. And as you come in, you're just instantly, the visuals, what's going on here, is just blowing your head off. You're just like, what is happening? What is happening? There's so much to see, there's so much going on. We've got huge, massive, big umbrella trees here for about twenty four ninety nine on a moss pole. Massive monsteras, huge aglaonemas, massive alocasias, lovely peperomia prostrata, actually. These are in for like £14, and they're huge. I've only got two of those left. Um, we've got a couple of different layers in the shop as you come round, so we can't. We like to sort of layer things out so you get a real nice visual of what's going on we got some lovely xanthosomas as well they're gorgeous we got santia vera snake plant mother-in-law's tongue sharp uh, we got some ornatas we got some bell marks we got some monstera peru we got different size snake plants pophos epipenrums we got cal- more calafias more monsteras we just had a load of monsteras come in actually now 24.99 they're about a meter tall they're absolutely gigantic um and then we've got the desk over on the right where we got a lot of the terrariums and stuff like that oh i've had some macalatas in as well begonias begonias i find to be quite a bizarre plant in general my experience with begonias is mainly in terrariums uh, i've got a couple of house plants but I tend to like just rooting them on and putting them in terrariums. They work really well in terrariums. Got some sedums in. Got some Drachiana. Is it Drachiana or Dracaena or Draciana? 
What are you thinking? I'm struggling personally with the pronunciation on that one, but I do struggle with a lot of the pronunciation on a lot of these uh, uh, plants. Apparently, Santiaveras are no longer Santiaveras, and they're a type of Dracchiana now. Um, so as you come round, you've got a few more. We've got ZZs at the back. We've got, more, uh, we've got some Ficus. Uh, we've got some pileas, we've got some euphorbias, we've got huge euphorbias. I've got two massive uh, 140 centimeter euphorbias actually in as well. Um, and you'll always get some cool music when you come into the jungle club. We're always playing a lot of cool music just to like keep the vibe up. And then towards the back, we've got our pots and we've got our smaller potted plants as well. Loads of our baby plants, which are super, super, super popular. Now, at the moment, this week, the most popular plant that's come through that people have been coming in and getting actually is the Monstera because we've had some absolutely mad deals on it. But I just wanted to give you all a bit of a, you know, you can open your eyes now. <laughs> uh, who, who actually closed their eyes? Some of you must have closed your eyes, I reckon. I was actually doing a bit of that with my eyes closed. So if anyone actually walked past, they probably thought, what on earth is he doing? Um, anyway, open your eyes. Don't want any accidents out there. But anyway, just wanted to give you a bit of a run through of the shop as you come through, what you're likely to see, what you like to experience. You know, we, we, we take a lot of, we put a lot of energy into our sh into, a, into the shops and the experience that people have when they come here. Always trying to bring in cool, healthy, good looking plants, interesting plants, um, rare stuff to easy care and everything in between is what we're always doing nice big specimen got a huge typhantiformum actually which is probably a little bit too big in my eyes because you'll have to have a massive house to uh actually enjoy it but it looks pretty good here i got it up high um got some buns eyes in as well they're not looking too bad but yeah so if you're in the worcester area come through next segment i'm going to be doing on monstera care that's a real popular plant. It's a plant that a lot of people either do really well with or some do struggle. So I'm going to be doing Monstera Care. Monstera or Monstera? Monstera Care next week. Um, hope you're all doing well. Hope you're all doing good. Peace out for now. Big up. Series 9 is brought to you with Lava Light. Derived from volcanic deposits, Lava Lights can help you to nourish and protect your plants all year round. The collection comprises of eight different horticultural growing media and pest control products. Look out for their colourful packs either online and in your local gardening stores. Um, Michael? Yeah, babe? Hi, I've got something uh, very exciting to discuss with you. A rash? <laughs> Not this time. That's yeah. private anyway. <laughs> As if. It's, it's this. What? Oh, that's my book bag, darling. It's your book. It arrives. I'm almost there. bored of it. <laughs> no, you're not. And I'm not because and I only just got it in my hands. And also, yeah. I need you to know that my nail varnish matches the book. Yeah. I'm really, really excited. Um, Have you opened it? I, I flicked through it. Because yeah. I won't be happy until you like it. Well, I'll tell you later when I've read Such it. Such is the pressure. <laughs> <I'm under. laughs> That's so harsh, isn't it? Um, read a page, read a page, read a page. Well, I've literally just opened it on yeah, this well, page. Read a random page. Read and page 32. That read is a random page. Up. Well, you will know what page 32 is, though. No, I don't. I'm just picking it out of the air. All right, page 32. Are you ready? I don't know what page. I don't know what page is what. Do you know what page is what in your book? I'm right. I have to just... No, of course not. I have to just <laughs> tell you before we go on. Yeah. This book is, uh, for any new listener, is Hortus yeah. Curious by Michael Perry, a.k.a. Mr. Plant Geek, your very co-host on this podcast. Discover the world's most weird and wonderful plants and fungi. And it is bright pink and it is it just looks totally cool. So <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, okay, so I'm going to read you a random page from the book. Yeah. Um, hang on a minute. I'm going to read you the noisiest plant, the okay. dynamite tree, the monkey no climb tree, uh, the sandbox tree. Um, this is the tree, I might add, if I ever see it, I always post like, this is the tree you do not want to give a hug. You definitely do not want to hug <laughs> yeah. this particular tree. That There's quite a few be, like that, isn't there? That is going <laughs> to hurt, right? Uh, you thought all trees were quiet and just kept themselves to themselves, didn't you? The most noise they might make is a rustling of leaves every now and then, but not so. Mm. 
This particular tree, the dynamite tree, which is the con- common name for it, grows to 60 meters tall. The canopy can reach 10 meters or more in width. It's from South America, found across the Amazon, um, and also been introduced elsewhere. But the fun part of this is. The seed pods violently and noisily crack open, exploding forth at 160 miles per hour and ricocheting off trees in the forest, hitting trunks and hopefully not your head, uh, (laughs) with a force and noise akin to a gunshot. No wonder it's sometimes called the dynamite tree. And there is more, but I won't read more because obviously... You didn't read the line about leather studs. I wanted you to get there. I haven't got... (laughs) Is that on the next page? Uh, No, I'm not sure. I can't remember, but no, don't worry, darling. It's cool. Well, hang... (laughs) Hold on, because I won't read it, but that is is a good drawing for people. Apparently, it's got leather studs as well. So they... (laughs) You know, it looks really cool. So congratulations. Well done to you. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that with bells on. So... Um, I I would also just like to tell you, however, when Mm. it arrived, I did feel a little queasy because yeah. inside the box was also a packet of Miracle Berry. Oh, wicked. Oh, are you going to bang on about that again? <laughs> I'm going to bang on about the fact that you did make me take Miracle Berries and drink vinegar and I w- w- was so sick for the rest of the night. Uh, but yeah, that's really cute. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. But um, because like... Um, Obviously, there's so much activity going on like this week and people getting their copies, their samples, that I think kind of tomorrow, is it tomorrow? Like publish day tomorrow. Yes. Is that, I think it's like an anti-climax, actually, because then it's already sipping out anyway. So, like, in my head, I think something big and amazing is going to happen tomorrow, but really probably nothing's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> well, you'll probably get quite a few congratulations from social media, yeah. right? that kind of thing. <laughs> But also, like, it is a big day. Like, I know the run-up to it all, mm. you know, kind of that that's all happening and it's going on. But on that day, you know, it's released. It's in the public domain. People can buy it, hopefully, yeah. forever more, you know. That's well, it's amazing. also, I don't know if the price goes up at some point, but it's ten ninety nine at the moment, which is really oh, good. It goes, it goes up and down, yeah. uh, especially on Amazon, depending on different factors. Yeah. So it will always change. Like an easy yeah. jet when you're trying to book a flight. <laughs> yeah. And like Google, when it knows you're trying to book a flight, that yeah, kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, cool. absolutely. But yeah, that's but really no, cool. That's cool. Oh, thank you very much. So I've just been jumping around queue today, filming uh, myself reading different excerpts from the book as well. What with and, the uh, plants near the plants that are in the book? No, no, that would be far too complex to do. Just buy cool <laughs> stuff. <laughs> um, and then uh, film some video because I'm hiding them in ten houseplant shops as well. Mm-hmm. So people can then go and find them and claim them for their own. So, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I'm happy. (laughs) When will you be releasing the information about, you know, them being hidden around and where people... I think uh, probably on Friday. So by the time this goes out, the competition will be on and people will have, like, perhaps gone and found them all. I don't know. Um, Yeah, we're just waiting for a couple more houseplant shops to receive their books and film their little mini videos. So, yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah, different activities around it, but it's, I'm really happy with how it looks. And I've got no room for my frying pans anymore because I've got 150 in my cupboard. <laughs> in <laughs> your I'm kitchen cupboard. Bags. That's really cool. In your kitchen cupboard. Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to send out myself with these little goodie bags and signed as well, so people can order through through my own website too. So. Yeah. That is very you, cool. you bought some of your own as well when you did it. Sorry? You bought some of your own books when you did it? Yeah, I, it's yeah, great yeah. to be able to take them if you're doing like a yeah, tour for yeah. a garden club or a show if they don't have them in stock, that kind of thing. And you get some nice oh, grubby man. cash in your hand as well, don't you? <laughs> yeah, real <laughs> life cash. We don't really have that so much anymore, do we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's cool. Uh, yeah, loads going on really, to be honest. Um, I just had a message on Instagram from someone. Jo and Co. love to grow. I don't know if you know her. Well, that rhymes. That's quite cool. She's like, I've been sent this. Is it legit or dodge? We can't decide. And it's like the flyer from my Lonely Plants Club that I'm working on this week with the Joy of Plants. Yeah. She thinks it's um, like uh, like I'm trying to fish her. (laughs) (laughs) We would love to fly I guess, like, there's so many, like, like scams. 
or scams or spam. There is like so much out there, isn't there? That I, I think people are cautious, spam. <laughs> which is a good thing to be cautious. But yeah, yeah, no, true actually, to be honest. But I guess if you receive something that's about kind of like online plant dating you mm. might well think what on earth does this mean so why don't you tell us what it means <laughs> i wouldn't but maybe that's my um yeah uh unusual mind <laughs> what is it about oh dear. Uh, it's the lonely plants club so it's like when people can come along and answer questions and get to date their ideal plant so yeah which is cool that sounds very fun what are you looking at you're very distracted ella merrick me? I'm not distracted at all. Looking up and down. <laughs> I'm, I'm just kind of looking around. I don't really have anything to about from your book. I only have your book <laughs> and the Lyrical Berries in front of me right now. Uh, hey, Maybe I'm your... just completely loving the illustrations. I'm kind of looking at them. They're really... I, I had some... Oh, sorry, we'll talk about the book again, but there we go. Um, I had some lovely compliments from Nat, you know, from Porter's, Nat Porter. And she yeah. just, the way she kind of described it is exactly how I wrote it and wanted it to come across so it's really made me super happy yeah that's really nice because it is yeah. it's designed so that someone who's got no interest in plants will be like you know I can imagine the scenario almost it's like I'm trying to give them a book you know oh read about plants you'll love it and they'll be like nah nah but this book <laughs> they will open it and it would it would change their minds it would change their minds and they would believe them you know they would enjoy reading about plants and that is really my kind of mission with the whole book to be honest yeah just to kind of change people's perception and straddle that line between serious botanist talk and oh what was it oh folk bees i did a little interview for her in norfolk yesterday yeah and i described it how do i describe it i'm straddling the line between serious botanists and kind of frivolous um, plant lovers or something. I can't remember what I wrote, but it was really good. <laughs> <laughs> was that good? You can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was exemplary. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Uh, Ellen, um, I, yeah, oh, go sorry, go, go for it. I was just going to complain about the weather because that's a good fella. <laughs> go on, then. That's what we do in Britain, complain about what the were weather. You say? Well, actually, interestingly, I was going to talk about the weather, but it wasn't here. I was just going to mention how you're an illustrator who yeah. has done such an amazing job he lives in florida doesn't he and his tropical garden has taken well oh, and yeah. it's just completely ruined because of the hurricane i oh, know so anybody that can go across and follow him support him he's absolutely watercolor and he's done such an amazing job and he hasn't uh, because of different delays here and there he hasn't got a copy of his own yet which i'm really uh-huh. really disappointed by and i really want to get a quick dhl out to him but yeah so Aww. he's really um yeah he needs that little bit of a lift and and i imagine that some of the the plants that have been destroyed in the tropical storm some of those of which were written for the book illustrated for the book so that makes it doubly sad as well so it does yeah. make it sad the hurricane so please follow him show him some love and tell him how much you love the illustrations because to me it's you know i wrote the book but it's nothing without illustrations so okay. i i see it as a co-write really you know the illustrations just yeah. really bring books alive yeah. and if you if you can nail Definitely. that it makes such a big difference doesn't yeah. it totally and especially enough. in this instance because we're talking about plants but also you need to see the thing that i'm describing as well so yeah yeah, yeah. Cool. well talking of the weather and not actually we're going to moan about how windy it is right now but um, yeah. that's nothing compared to obviously what went on uh, as well. I don't, uh, yeah that but was that was a badly it, placed part of the book it though. has just <laughs> suddenly got super super windy and somebody had yeah. left their recycle bin at the front of the house and it's literally blown away down the street oh, <laughs> <the drama. laughs> yeah oh ellen but it's that weird weather where it's kind of it's sort of awe to me, but it's sort of still warm, but then it's windy. It's kind of weirdly sticky and kind of cold at the same time. You don't know what jacket to wear. And, oh, yeah. I hate that sort of weather. I'd like either be hot or cold, you know? A jacket is a real life issue. I agree with that. What oh. outerwear do you wear at this time of year? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, Probably something more to do. Are you doing something at skate park soon? Have I missed it? No, it's this week. Uh, actually, oh, cool. uh, it's at the, this weekend, so when this goes out, it's uh, called The Skate Retreat, and you can yeah. find it online. And it's run by an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous person called Plot 31. Plot underscore 31, I think it is. She is the coolest skateboarding girl ever. 
and uh, she runs the skateboard retreats and this one is in Norfolk at the weekend and um, there's a few throughout the month so I'm going up there to give some uh, forest bathing walks mm-hmm. and talks and I probably won't skateboard although when I was younger I was a bit of a skateboarder yeah. I've got to admit um, and you stay in kind of like huts and there's a ton of stuff like talks and uh nighttime wildlife spotting and then there's like a moon ritual going on and just really outdoorsy with nature like being inspired by the trees and the wildlife that kind of thing uh, she's made loads of food from harvest from her allotment and mm. just in general it looks really really cool and i'm going to be staying in a hut in the pitch black there's no signal at all i'm told not even any 3g nothing so yeah i think i this kind of thing i'm literally probably not even gonna get changed i will sleep in what i'm in in the day just literally go to bed under a blanket (laughs) (laughs) you don't see anything no (laughs) and then get up and just get on with the next day so yeah i think that would be really really cool it's nice just to be out in nature and you know hear the owls at night time and watch the moon so it's really really cool yeah and doing some forest bathing so yeah I'm so happy for you. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much. Oh, I, no you know, like you just said, how I, you, today you'd been at Q. That's mm. that sounds kind of glamorous, doesn't it? And often you say to me, "What have you been doing today, Ellen?" And I can tell you a little bit about what I've been doing. But today I have been in my garage, which the door has been open, and I've been scrubbing the floor from cat poo. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> how did they get in there then? Because the what? door was because the door is open, so. Um, and then to make myself feel better, I yeah. came into the garden and planted some um, new um, healy balls and I planted some spring balls. I planted some snowdrops yeah. and some crocus. And yeah, I just generally gave the front garden a little bit of a tidy oh. up, to keep those cats off it as well. Oh, no worries. Mm. Yeah, well, so now you're distracted. You're, oh, literally, yeah. you're literally like this. Is really boring. <laughs> I actually so said the do... wrong word to go back with. I was like, oh, no worries. And then I was like, oh, rubbish. That doesn't fit the conversation. Doesn't fit the conversation because <laughs> you weren't paying any attention. <laughs> I had anyway. Uh, Ellen, um, I did another Timberland workshop tonight. Balcony planters. Yeah, nice. Yeah. How did the last one go? Yeah, really cool. Thank you very much for asking. Um, <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, but no, it was really cool. But it is, it's so funny how people's different interpretation of planting manifests, isn't it? Like, <laughs> even when you've shown people what to do, the way that they do it is they they do some really strange things in workshops. You know what I mean? <laughs> in what way? What do you mean? Like, some some people were like them planting, but then the plant is kind of then halfway up the pot. So maybe they've got a pot that's 12 inches high and they've only put six inches of soil in there. And then right. they're planting into six inches of soil. I'm kind of like, okay. <laughs> it's just funny, the very different ways that people plant and like, because I guess it's instinctive to us, but for them, it's the very first time they're coming to it. And if I was yeah. in a, make in a sushi making class i'm sure i would be you know putting the seaweed everywhere but like yeah it's yeah. just very funny the way that people understand things and yeah but that's how you learn isn't it like you'll yeah, do, yeah, totally. people do stuff totally. like that and then be like oh that didn't i'm like, like um, <laughs> you can imagine how how cute i am um like i feel like really um don't shrivel your nose up at me um but i feel really like i don't want to tell them when they've done it wrong so i'm kind of like oh i want if it might look nicer two inches up not like oh you've done it completely wrong <laughs> so no, i mean you need to be encouraging right no, but I, I would definitely say yeah i guess so but like you know. they might walk away from that thinking oh michael just likes it two inches up rather than like it should look to it should be two inches higher yeah. <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i it's think you can funny. be a little bit more what's the word authoritative on it because yeah. it is for their benefit. I don't, never want to tell people off. I want people. It's to not about them. telling them off, is it? It's just about saying, oh, if you have it a bit higher up, then this yeah. helps because there's more root space and da da da. You know. <laughs> I don't know. It's a funny old world. <laughs> it's a funny old world. Um, we've got our new series with Lava Light. We've got Q mini series, which we're very honoured to have. We've got new contributors. 
We've got new little um, adverts as well. We've got adverts for Lava, like the sponsor, but we've also got adverts for the Q podcast as well. Cross yeah. promo, Ellen. We're grown ups now. We, we, we're adulting. How yeah, about that? The Q, no less. <laughs> the Q mini series is actually really cool. And um, I was actually thinking about it just yesterday. I just thoroughly enjoyed chatting uh-huh. with guests for, for the I Q. I saw your today. new friend today. Did you? Elena, when I was in there, yeah. I'm, I'm totally envious of you. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, that, I, you want to be her friend. <laughs> I'm very excited about this series. Like, I think there's some really cool stuff coming up. And um, uh, even yeah. including, like, royal parks. And yeah, we're going to yeah. switch things up a little bit, too. And we'll be uh, doing our gossips and news. Well, I think... Um, I'm obviously going back to North Carolina, but pre that I'm going to New York, so I'm going to be gossiping. I, I'm going to be so excited because I'm going to go to the flower market and to Brooklyn Botanic Garden and New York Botanic Gardens, and it's going to be a whole few days of like plants and flowers. And I am you literally, say. I am giddy with excitement. <laughs> You're going to Botanic Garden? Yeah. Oh, you need to meet up with Mark then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and Brooklyn. You're going to get him on the podcast at some point, so you need to hassle him yeah. about that. <laughs> okay. About sex and orchids. Yeah, I'm so sex excited. And, like, and orchids. I'm so excited. I genuinely feel like I could. Did cry. you wet your plants? I haven't. I know the rain's wet in my plants right now. Oh my god, it's raining here. It's raining vertically. Yeah. No, not vertically. What's the other one? Horizontally. Horizontally. <laughs> well, diagonally, to be honest. But it's a. Oh my god! Oh my god! It's like oh. It's, it's just started here as well. Oh, I gotta go out that in that in a minute. I'll need a umbrella. Hey, oh. you'll need a different jacket. That's oh, for sure. Gosh. You need yeah, a waterproof. I know. <laughs> well, I've got loads of Timberland jackets now, and I, Ellen Mary. <laughs> oh, you're stuck up, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Who's get you, now? get you with the big <laughs> brands. <laughs> oh, awesome. All right. Well, it's very nice chatting with you, and. Um, I hope you don't get too drenched when you go outside. I've uh, I've completely abandoned my plans to go to the allotment, seeing how heavy the rain is. So yeah, <laughs> I'll be doing something else. <laughs> cool. All right. Yes. Okay. Speak soon. Fun. <laughs> The music for the Plant Based podcast is part of the song Grow by Mikey James, and our editor is Gareth Patch of Semi Echo. Mm-hmm.